Log Talk Radio. Welcome to Awake to Oneness Radio. I am your host, my name is Caroline Chang, and the mission of Awake to Oneness Radio is to inspire the world to awake to oneness. Spirituality and science are both telling us that we are literally all connected, that we're all one. And once the world awakes to this truth, there will be peace on earth. Um, I also want to tell everybody, welcome to spring. Today is the first day of spring. And today, I live in the Poconos, and it has been snowing all day. We have a good six to eight inches of new snow for the first day of spring. But welcome to spring. Um, The topic of today's show is suicide from a spirit spiritual perspective. This is the second show in a series of show shows on on the topic of suicide. I shared with the audience in last week's show um, my connection, my personal connection to suicide and how um, in December of 2011, um, when doctors told me my son was hospitalized and on life support, and doctors told me They didn't think he was going to make it. They wanted to take him off life support. Uh, At that time, uh, three years ago, I couldn't handle it, and I tried to commit suicide myself. So that's kind of why I opened my show with this topic, because of my personal experience with it. True miracle. A true miracle on 34th Street, Christmas of December 2011. I say that because the hospital was actually located on 34th Street. And that Christmas, that December, my son and I both went home. Um, We went home the day before New Year's Eve. So I did experience a true miracle on 34th Street, Christmas of 2011. Today's guest is Barbara Browski. She is um, a channel, and she channels her spirit guide by the name of Aaron. Um, she also was one of the co- uh, collaborators that helped Robert write his books. Robert was our guest last week, and this is how I got in contact with Barbara initially. I got in contact with Barbara May of 2014, this past May, when my son was hospitalized um, again, and I reached out to her, and she responded back to me. And I've been in contact with Barbara ever since via email. We've been in contact. But let me go ahead now and introduce you to Barbara. Um, uh, Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara, go ahead. Barbara. Thank you, Carolyn, okay. and welcome to all of those who are listening. It's a privilege to be on the show, Caroline, and the uh, focus of your a week to one, this is so much what my focus is in my life and in my teaching. The first thing I want our listeners to know is that I am totally deaf in both ears. So I use a deaf telephone. Caroline's words don't reach my ears at all. I have a screen on my telephone. So I'm reading what Caroline says, and there may be some time delay. Please be patient with us as we allow this technology to serve us imperfectly, but perfectly. Caroline, I don't want to just give a monologue here since there's no way for you to easily cut in and 
break in, I'm just going to say go ahead and let the viewers, let the listeners know also, as we pass this back and forth, we'll say go ahead. I'll come back and introduce myself, but I want to leave Caroline space to say anything she needs to say. Go ahead. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, right now, I'd like for you, Barbara, to share with our listening audience um, your story and how you came to be a channel. I'd be delighted to do that. I lost my hearing in 1972, soon after our first child was born. I knew nothing about deafness. It affected not only the hearing, but my balance mechanism in my inner ears. So I had no balance. I was dizzy. I couldn't hear. And I had a newborn baby. It was pretty devastating. It was frightening. I felt so cut off from the world. I felt angry. Why me? And I really didn't know how to cope. I couldn't even walk to take care of the baby. I got through the next years with different coping mechanisms. Mostly I just pushed aside the pain and said, I'm going to handle this. And yeah, we can all cope. But I coped by shutting my heart to myself, to the pain, to the experience, to the anger. I had two more children. I have a very loving husband of almost five decades now, not then, but loving husband then of a long time already. I taught sculpture at University of Michigan. I had work that I loved. I had loving friends, but I felt so cut off from people and from God. So the years went by. Eventually... Coping well, but still caught in the anger, I prayed for help. I don't really know what kind of help I was expecting. It definitely was not to have a discarnate entity appear in my living room as I was meditating. So as I sat there that morning, I felt his presence so strongly. I could see it. Uh almost a biblical-looking figure with a long white beard, deep blue eyes, high cheekbones, very beautiful, white light pouring from him. What's this? I was very startled. I got up, I went into the kitchen. I thought to myself, either I'm hallucinating or it's real, and I don't know which one scares me more. I had a cup of tea. I came back. He was still there. So I asked, who are you? Why are you here? He said, you asked for help. I'm here to help. (laughs) How are you going to help, I asked him. He said, you're suffering. Let's look at the causes of the suffering. And he helped me to see that the deafness was not the cause of the suffering, but the fear of deafness, how I related to this experience of not hearing how I felt that things should be different than what I was experiencing. Could I just not hear? It was a very powerful couple of months for me. I worked with him daily. I got my children off to school and spent hours with him. At first, he told me simply to call him a teacher, and later he shared the name Aaron. I tell this story in much detail in my book, Cosmic Healing, which can be found on Amazon, published by North Atlantic Books, can be found in many bookstores also, for anyone who would like to read about it in more detail. So people began to come to me and say, can we talk to Aaron? If you can, how will you talk to Aaron? Aaron said to me, just listen the way you do when I talk to you and say aloud what I'm telling you. Somebody then said, you're channeling. 
What's channel? This was really new to me. But I got the hang of it, and I realized that this was really why I had come into the incarnation, the service I could do. People began to ask me to teach them the meditation that he was teaching me. So we started to do this together. And then some of these people that were coming to learn meditation and to talk with Aaron I said, let us form a non-profit organization to support this so you can focus on the work itself. And thus, back in 1989, Deep Spring Center was born. Our actual name, Deep Spring Center for Meditation and Spiritual Inquiry. The meditation, one part of it, and the spiritual inquiry. Who are we? Why are we here? How do we do the work we came to do in this incarnation? In the face of anger, pain, fear, judgment, confusion, how do we keep our hearts open and love? So once a week we got together to meditate. Once a week two people just gathered to talk with Aaron about these questions. And it's been 27 years now. Aaron and I teach now all over the world and have written many books together. It's wonderful because wherever I go, people are asking the same questions, and it really helps me experience our connection to each other. We're all here, spirit incorporated in these human bodies, trying to live this human experience with love and asking, how do I do it? So that's my basic story. I feel very blessed to have been given this work to do, to share this with that. It's an enormous joy to be able to talk with you, the listeners out there, and I hope that we can speak to your hearts and hear some of your questions. Caroline's first question to me was to speak about suicide from a spiritual perspective. So I'll do that myself. And then Aaron will incorporate. When I say incorporate, we used to, he used to channel consciously through me. I would hear him and repeat what I heard. But somewhere along the line, it became clear we needed to do it a different way. And I learned to simply move my consciousness out of the body. And Aaron literally to incorporate in the body. When he is incorporated, I don't remember anything he says. I'm not here. I'm sitting out under a tree somewhere, relaxed. Aaron literally is talking. Caroline, before I start to answer your question about my take on suicide from a spiritual perspective, let me return this to you to see if there's anything you want to say. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barbara, for sharing in such detail um, your your experience and how you came to be a channel for Aaron. Um, and also, your book, uh, Cosmic Consciousness, is also available on my website, which is awaketooonenessradio.org. There's also a link for the book there. Um, so basically, um, like I said, the first four shows that I'm doing is on the topic of suicide from a spiritual perspective because of how that topic touched my, my life. And I wanted to share my story and um, get um, perspective from other spiritual leaders on the um, and spiritual teachers on that topic. So um, I'd like to turn it back over to you, Barbara, and if you can um, answer that question from your perspective, um, give us uh, your perspective on suicide. Go ahead, Barbara. Barbara. Barbara, can you hear me? Go ahead, Barbara. I'm Thank sorry, you, guys. Okay. 
Thank you. We still have to get the logistics of this go ahead to process it right. I know our leaders can la- our listeners can laugh with us. Yes. Okay, I come to this. Uh, I have a very varied religious background. Born in a, to a Jewish family, my religious practice affiliation these days for the past 30 years is as a Quaker with a Christian background. And I'm also a recognized Buddhist teacher. I'd rather not speak from any of those perspectives. This is my own personal take on it. The incarnation is hard. We've agreed to come into these bodies. Sometimes we're very confused about why we came. We've picked up various catalysts along the way, what I call teachers. But some of these teachers are really painful. We have free will. If we need to leave, we can leave. That's a choice we can make. We have to recognize that we are always responsible karmically for our choices. If we hurt people through our choices, we have that karmic responsibility. Now, sometimes the choice for suicide can both hurt people and also be a gift. For example, somebody who is very, very sick may choose to end their life. Because the illness is becoming both a physical and an economic burden on their families and because there's absolutely no hope of recovery. They've made that choice for a loving reason and not a fear-based reason. However, people are going to be sad and frightened and angry. So it's really a question of the karma. And when we make that choice, if we make that choice. Are we willing to be responsible for the karma we're creating? To recognize I've made a choice. As a Dharma teacher, I counsel many, many people, and occasionally there are people who feel suicidal or who have suicidal members of their family. All I can bring to these questions is Whatever your choices, can they be made with as much love as possible and without bling? This is a me, oh. just a Barbara the human and talking. Now, I'd really like to switch this to Aaron at this point because Aaron has such profound wisdom, such a deep insight. So I think he may be able to answer this question with more clarity. Again, I'm going to simply give this to Caroline for a minute, see if she has anything she wants to add, and then Aaron is going to literally incorporate, take over this body, and talk to you all. I want to say to the listeners out there, you do not have to believe that Aaron is real. His thoughts are coming from somewhere. If they are helpful to you, use them. If they're not helpful to you, lay them aside. It's like walking down the street and finding a book without a cover. You pick it up, it's wonderful. It really speaks to your heart, but you have no idea who the author is. Can that be okay? Or you pick up a book by a famous author and it doesn't speak to you. Lay it aside. So don't worry too much about who Aaron is. Is he real? Just is it helpful? I want to add one more thought here. I love the fact that here I am in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and talking to people hopefully from all over the country. Uh, I feel Caroline's focus is on oneness, and I love how this radio and phone call can connect us. Caroline, go ahead. Okay, thank you so much, Barbara, so much. And actually, the wonderful thing about Internet radio and podcasts is that it actually reaches the world, not just the country. 
Uh, this show can be listened to by anyone with a computer, and it can be listened to at any time. So that's the wonderful thing about Internet radio and podcasting. Uh, not only are we having the technical um, issue with um, the death phone, but like I had mentioned earlier, we got about eight inches of snow here in the Poconos, and my beautiful, wonderful neighbor is in my driveway with his 4 by 4 plowing my uh, driveway right now. So if you heard any, I had to actually move my location because it was so loud. Um, my office is my studio, and uh, my office is in the front of the house where, I, where the driveway is, and I could barely hear myself think a minute ago because of the my wonderful neighbor plowing my driveway. <laughs> So, okay, um, yes, i like for us, now we're going to go back and go back to Aaron, actually. So now we are going back to Aaron. Aaron, go ahead. Let's all just breathe for a minute. Give me a minute for Aaron to incorporate. Holding space for him. My blessings and love to you all. I am Aaron. Interesting technology here. Because on a phone, we are all discarnate entities. You're out there listening to me. From your perspective, you have a body, but I can't see you. From my perspective, I am incorporated in a body. It doesn't matter where I am. Eventually, you're all going to be telepathic. But for now, we need this technology. So I am asked to speak about suicide. As Barbara said, the incarnation can be very painful. We don't need pain to teach us. We need to be awake, present, to learn. But sometimes pain becomes that which makes us more awake and present. Why do we choose pain? It's hard to say. Often it doesn't feel people have a conscious choice. I want to make it clear I am not saying that people have chosen their pain. People have chosen to learn, to grow. And sometimes within that process of growth, there becomes very severe pain. As a simple example, somebody who through many lifetimes has been filled with anger and resentment to others. The decision in this lifetime may have been, I am going to learn how to truly open my heart to others and to myself. How to cease this infernal judgment that always seems to accompany my consciousness. I am willing to experience what I need to experience to get past this judging mind and anger. So that person was into an incarnation perhaps with very judgmental and angry parents. Because of the anger surrounding the person. They are constantly prompted to be angry. But there's something within them that so much wants to be loving. If this person, this hypothetical individual, had incarnated into a deeply loving family, Because of their old karma, 
they still would have found themselves to be often an angry and judgmental person, but more able to push it aside. But because of the incarnational experience, it's very hard to push aside. It's constantly anger and judgment around them. Very painful. At a certain point, given the support that they need of loving friends, therapists, spiritual practices, and so forth, they may find the tools to break through and begin to see that the judging mind, the angry mind, is not who they are. That the judgment and the anger simply arise out of experience. We'll talk about it in a very specific way. You have a mind and a body. When something touches the body, there's a physical sensation of touching. If you smell a rose, there's a very sweet scent, smelling, pleasant. If you smell a skunk, there's a very unpleasant scent. It's very normal. This is the human experience. You are mammals. So when something is pleasant, you want more of it. When something is unpleasant, you want it to go away. In the beginning, we take this whole flow of experience so personally and build a solid, separate self on it. But you are not your body. You are not your mind. You are a divine consciousness, divine and radiant spirit. Through meditation and other practices, people can begin to see how the thoughts that arise in the mind, the sensations that arise in the body, are simply arising out of conditions, are impermanent, are not really the core of a being. If my anger is not who I am, then who am I? If my pain is not who I am, then who am I? So this hypothetical person may be blessed to finally break it through that sense of I am my anger, my pain, and so forth. And find this deeper sense of inner radiance. But sometimes the person has taken on such a heavy load of work in the life that it really becomes impossible. <sighs> Let me use a simple example. If you break your leg, you can deal with that pain. If you are driving your car, or in an accident, break your leg and your whole family is killed. Strong emotional pain and a broken leg. And you've broken your neck as well. The body doesn't move. The emotions are feeling guilt and grief. Suddenly at a certain point it may be overwhelming. Sometimes in our hurry to mature, to move ahead spiritually, we do take on heavier loads than might be merciful to us. So I find that a lot of people who suicide have decided as they came into the Incarnation to do such deep work that they become overwhelmed. They simply feel, I cannot do it. And they make the decision, I need to leave. It is not sinful to leave, as some of your earth religions would say. For me, the real sadness there is, once you leave, you can't immediately come back. You've spent so much time preparing for this incarnation. And then you've destroyed it. Well, 
you will come back. You are not punished for leaving. I would not call it punishment. The sadness is simply in the realization, whoops, I should have stuck around. Maybe I could have worked it out. But still, for some, there's a huge sigh of relief. I did take on too much. In preparing for this lifetime, I did not listen to my guidance. So I decided to try to finish everything, and it was too much. I will return, but I will return taking on less, understanding the with mercy to the human. King on what is manageable. And then the person will come back. Trying it again. Again with that wish in our hypothetical example to move beyond judgment and anger. And the strong self identity with those. So this is how I see suicide. People sometimes need to choose to leave. As Barbara said, they are responsible karmically for that choice. But we cannot say it's bad or good. It may have been skillful or unskillful. Well, I use those terms, skillful or unskillful, to me, unskillful is a choice made largely out of fear. Skillful is a choice made largely from love. Usually there's some mixture of both. But which is the balance, fear or love? And then the person will work on the other side, understanding the choices and preparing to come back and try again. And this is what's so beautiful about the whole process of reincarnation, that you always get another chance. I'd like to pause here. Caroline, questions from you, and there's more I can say about it, but I think my preference would be to hear specific questions from listeners to which I can respond. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, specific questions. Right now, um, The only but there's no particular callers on the line. This is a new show, so... Not many live listeners, but we do. We will get more listeners uh, to listen to the replay of this show um, because it will be on the internet, available anytime for anybody. Um, I guess I, my question would be um, for a parent that might be dealing with uh, suicide right now of a of a child. Um, I do know of um, people that have lost children. To suicide, uh, one of a coworker of mine's uh, son uh, took his life at 14 years old. Um, this was many years ago. This was in the 90s, um, and so I know that's a difficult thing for parents to to go through losing a child, especially through suicide. So maybe if you can um, address that question for the listeners, Aaron, go ahead. Thank you, Caroline. I'll be happy to address that question. There are two important things for the parent, three important things for the parent to realize. First, there is going to be guilt, feelings of guilt, of self-recrimination. I should have been able to fix it. These are going to arise naturally. Part of what the parent is learning, and perhaps the child has agreed to help support the parent to learn this, is to forgive the self, not to blame the self. This doesn't mean that we don't attend to things that are distorted in the self. But the child or any suicidal person has free will. The parent, spouse, friend, sibling, whoever it may be, 
is not responsible for the other's choice. You are responsible to be as loving as you can to the person who is suicidal, to try your best to meet their needs, and yet to know they have free will and they will make their own choices. Second, remember that this person is what this human that you knew was one expression of a, an eternal soul. The soul is not destroyed. Spend time praying and meditating with this one who was left. Talk to them. Especially let them know of your love for them. If you are bewildered and angry, it's okay to say, I feel bewildered. I feel angry. I feel grief and pain. But I still love you. And I know you can hear me at some level. I forgive you and I ask you to forgive yourself. When I say to forgive yourself, not that they have done something, quote, wrong, unquote but rather that they may be looking at themselves with regret and self-recrimination. I shouldn't have done that. So it's an opportunity for everyone to practice love and forgiveness. Third, in some situations, there has been a pre-life agreement between the parent and the child. Caroline, you asked me specifically about a parent with a child, but this would also be true of a spouse or a child with a parent who is suicidal or a friend. Sometimes there has been a pre-life agreement. I am going to leave at some point, and you are going to have to deal with it. Coming back to the child and parent, the child is not suiciding to teach the parent, and for no other reason. The child has his own reasons for leaving, but part of the pre-life agreement it may be that that child will help the parent learn about grief and letting go. In some pre-life agreements, there's simply an agreement that the child will leave at an early age without any set plan of how it will be, not necessarily suicide. It could be through an automobile accident or an illness. But the child and parent have the two souls together in the pre-life agreement haven't made the decision. The child is going to leave for his own, his or her own reasons, and also to help the parent learn about grief and letting go, about the continuity of love. Then it depends on so many conditions which way out the child chooses. So it could have been that automobile accident, or a devastating illness, or it could be suicide. I'll pass this back to you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, I Go do ahead. understand what you're, you're saying about the pre-planned and pre-planned agreements that um, our souls make, because I believe that when I was in the hospital um, this past uh, summer, spring and summer with my son, I believed um, that um, my son and I had made this agreement. Um, before birth, before I was born, I I believed in my heart. I didn't know why he and I made such an agreement, but I believed in my heart that he and I had made this agreement, and that's why we were going through what we were going through. Um, and that's what got me through um, the most difficult time of my life, knowing that it was a, a pre-birth plan that my son and I made together. Um, also, I, I need to let the audience know the call-in number, just in case 
you guys are not looking at your screen and don't see the call-in number. If there, if anyone has a question for Aaron, um, could you you can call. The number is three four seven eight five seven one zero three eight. Again, I'll repeat that number. Um, if you have a, a question for Aaron, you can call in at three four seven eight five seven one zero eight three. Um again, uh this being such a new show, this is just the second show. Don't have too many live listeners right at the moment. Um but uh the thing I love about internet radio <laughs> is that you can listen to the show at any time and it is uh anyone can listen to this show as a replay uh broadcast podcast around the world you have a computer you can listen so that's the wonderful thing Aaron. i'd just like for you to share your your wisdom with with me and the listening audience um so um whatever you feel would be helpful for us to know and to learn right now would be wonderful go ahead Aaron. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. The most important thing that comes to mind, thank you, Caroline. The most important thing that comes to mind is that you are all souls on a path of evolution. Each of you aspires to learn more fully how to love, to know your own divinity and that of all beings to know your interconnection with all beings. There are so many painful catalysts in life that trigger fear, anger, even hatred. Ignorance, confusion, prejudice, greed. It's very hard to keep the heart open and loving. When you begin to view the challenging experiences as teachers, rather than as something that leads you to further withdraw and close your heart, then you begin to learn. As Caroline has told us, with her experiences with her son, and as Barbara has described, with how she was able to open her heart to the pain of death. These experiences do not come to punish you. They are the result of many conditions. They are not predestined. They are the result of many conditions. And the more you are able to open your heart and say, okay, this has arisen and it's very painful, what is it offering me the opportunity to learn How can I keep the heart open even with this? As you become more skilled at this, you find that you are living more and more with an open heart. Then the tragedies of life. The times when our children or loved ones die of illness or accident, when they die of suicide, The people dying all over the world in wars and from natural disasters. It finally ceases to be their problem, their death, their pain. We start to experience it as our pain. And this is what enlarges the heart. This is what it leads us truly to know our interconnection with all beings and the capacity of this heart we all share to bring love to the places of being the more beings that learn this the more we are finally going to have world peace and happiness it is the nature of the mammal that it is impermanent 
you age, you die. You get sick and die. The mind moves into despair and there is suicide. The mammal form is impermanent. Because you love so deeply, it's so painful to lose what you love. And yet, how can you ever really lose another person? They are carried in your heart. So please keep in mind through your pain that this pain comes to you as a gift. An opportunity to experience the enormity of the loving heart. Your capacity for love. We are told stories of people who, for example, were in concentration camps in World War II. Very interesting that those who survived, many of them, were those who instead of closing off themselves from other people and living in selfishness are the ones who reached out the most who shared their food, their blankets, their love with others. These are the ones who survived. For those who have lost a loved one to suicide, look around you. See in what ways you can help others who are newly going through this experience. What perspective have you gained? In some communities, there are groups for survivors of suicide. Often those groups are of people who are newly left by the suicidal one. Sometimes somebody who experienced this and has worked their way through it for a few years and has a deeper more loving perspective can be of real help to others. How can you reach out and support others? Again, I pass this back to you, Caroline. Go ahead. Thank you, Erin. Thank you so much. You you just touched upon so many things that resonate with me. Um, truly, the oneness of our we're all connected. I know that every living being, every not every, we're all connected, and that's the purpose of this show to help, even if it just helps one person a week. Um, you know, inspires them to the truth of our connectedness, of our oneness, and also my experience that I I went through with my son, um, and how I I'm trying to use that experience as a way to help other people that are maybe going through the same thing I went through or in the future or someone struggling with an illness of a child, whether it might, my son was an adult, he was 29 years old, but he was my child. And I know there are other people struggling with that, so I figured I, I hope that I can be an inspiration to help someone else who is struggling with that same difficulty. We have someone um, with a question. Uh, someone is calling now from 570 area co- code. 570 area code, you are now live. You have a question? Hello? Hi. My name is Hi. Erin, E-R-I-N. <laughs> and oh, okay. I, am, I have found you through a uh, meetup group. And actually, I have a question. I recently lost a very, very dear friend over the summer to suicide. And he and I had uh, both talked about he had lost a brother uh, several years before this to cancer. And he never rebounded from his brother's death. He took it very, very hard. And I believe it put him into depression. As a matter of fact, I know it did because he said it did. And he couldn't recover from his brother's death. And 
ever since he committed suicide, he did it by um, killing himself in his car through um, poisoning uh, with the, the gases from the car. Mm-hmm. And the fumes. Mm-hmm. he and he friends of ours, mutual friends of the two of us, uh, always said, "We don't know why he would do it. He had so much in his life going for him, and it was the coward's way out, and uh we all thought he had everything to live for because he had money, a good job, this and that going for him, good looks, the whole nine yards." And I, in return, got very defensive because I loved him so much. And I said to him, to the gang, I said, he only did it for one reason, if you ask me, and that was because he was depressed. And I was just wondering if Aaron could give me some insight on this. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Aaron, um, hopefully you were able to hear that. Um, question, Aaron, go ahead, if you heard it. If you not, I'll try to repeat it. Aaron, go ahead. Yes. I heard it. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. I have several responses to this. First, depression is an especially painful aspect of your culture. I'm not saying it doesn't happen in other other cultures. But in your culture, there is a lot of depression related to feelings of unworthiness. And in some other cultures, feelings of unworthiness are not so frequent. Some people who took birth in this culture took birth literally to experience feelings of unworthiness, feelings of abandonment. Unworthiness and abandonment go together. The brother dies, and there's a feeling, I could not save him, unworthy. He left him, abandonment and self-anger. When you see this in people around you, you must always reach out to try to help. Help to steer them to whatever medical and spiritual help will support them through it and so forth. But also to remember they have free will. They need to make their own choices. So when somebody who seems to have everything going for them chooses to die, realize that this person at a deep soul level did not have everything going for him. He or she lacked the strength to give love to the self. My, I'm not looking in the Akashic records here. My guess is that the brother's death triggered ancient abandonment issues, which thus triggered the depression. Depression is a literally a closing down of the body energy, limiting of the body energy, so that life force cannot flow through. You cannot fix another. You can open a door for another, but you cannot push them through. So it's so important to remember if someone chooses to leave in that way. It's not up to you to figure out why they made that choice. Or to look at the choice and say, well, the person was depressed. There should have been help. I should have been able to help, etc. But just to say... This human made a choice. I'm sad about the choice, even angry about the choice. I feel abandoned. But I will honor this person's choice with love. 
I will forgive this person for the pain their choice caused me. In this way, this person's choice becomes a gift to you to remember how to keep your heart open with love, even through the pain of the loss. In this way, you honor the person rather than minimizing the person. I will pass this back to you. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Erin. That was so beautiful about keeping your heart open to love and and no judgment. I mean, your your friends, Erin, um, the caller, your friends that are, you know, kind of passing judgment a little bit on your friend that took his life, just um, realize there's no judgment. There's no judgment. It was his decision, and just keep your heart open to love for him, and he's, he's still really all, always with you. Thank you so much for calling, and uh, I hope you continue to listen to the show. Thank you, Aaron. I do. Bye-bye. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, uh, we are winding down. The hour goes by so quickly. Oh, uh, we are winding... let me add something here. Oh, May yes. Speak? Yes, please. Go ahead, Aaron. May I... Let me give one last thought here. It's important to, when judgment arises to realize it's simply a thought. We can't say, I should not be judgmental. That's just more judgment. Can we keep our hearts open to ourselves? The judgment arose because of the sadness and anger and fear. The more we keep the heart open, the more we release those factors so that the heart can stay more open with love. Thank you all, anybody who has been listening. My blessings and love to you. I'll return you to Caroline. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Hal. Go ahead. Hal is, um, hello? Yes, Hal is um, Barbara's husband who has been signing and helping us with the technical issues of the death phone. But thank you to everybody, on the, everyone who is listening, everyone who will listen to this uh, replay podcast. Um, I am so honored, Barbara, that you and Aaron um, agreed to be my guests, and I am so thankful that uh, everyone is um, being so supportive and loving, and the feedback I've been getting back is wonderful. So I thank everybody. Um, Next week, our show will be, our guest next week will be Anne Per Per Ear, and she is the author, her son, did commit suicide. Her son, Stephen, committed suicide when he was 15, and she wrote the book, Stephen Lives. And so she will be our guest next week, um, and I'm hoping to uh, to uh, speak with everybody and see everybody, not to hear everybody next week. Okay, it is time for me to sign off. Everybody have a great week, and I will be back, and I'll see you next week. Love, everybody. Uh oh, you there? Uh oh. Oh, Barbara. Oh, wait. Okay. Barbara? Uh oh, my fault. Barbara. Barbara, you there? Barbara? I'll call you back. Ah, uh, let me call. Mm.